I'll just do a quick introduction. So hi everyone and thanks for joining our Global Liberal Arts Taster session. Today we've got uh, Dr. Mark Whedon who's going to talk about time and histories of the world and give us a short overview of what li Global Liberal Arts is and uh, what the programme is like at SOAS. We've also got a student ambassador. So Mark, do you want to get started? Yeah, thanks very much. Okay then, Global Liberal Arts, what is it? Um, a lot of us don't, a lot of us uh, probably have never heard of this before, Global Liberal Arts. Well, it's an idea for uh, taking a new approach to learning about the world, essentially, and to um, approaching academic learning in general. Um, oops, why can't I go forward? Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, oh, here we are. Things have gone a bit wrong already. Right, um, so the traditional approach to academia is to learn a particular subject. So academic knowledge is um, divided up into lots of different subcategories, lots of uh, silos. You become a historian or you become a philosopher, you um, study politics, Maybe you want to become a politician, I don't know. Cultural studies, sociology, uh, development studies. These are all separate silos. And the whole point of global liberal arts is a degree that tries to train you to do the basics in a good number of these disciplines and to basically produce a, an academic environment where these different disciplines that are usually studied on their own can start talking to each other. Um, that, I would say, is the basic principle behind global liberal arts. It's an approach, a holistic approach to education that involves learning lots of different disciplines and trying to bring them into communication with each other. Um, at SOAS, let's say there are four principles um, underlying the education in global liberal arts. We have flexibility. You're able to design your own intellectual journey on this degree. Interdisciplinarity, that's really at the heart of it. So the degree um, combines humanities, linguistics, and social sciences, for example. Reflexivity, which is all about learning how to learn. And employability, thinking critically and solving complex problems, working in teams. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the structure of the Global Liberal Arts degree. And then um, I'm going to, as this is a taster session, give you a little extract, perhaps a quarter of a lecture that the students got this year from um, year one, uh, from the year one of the year one core courses. So the Global Liberal Arts degree is divided up into um, four tracks. You've got a skills and method track each year, a global track each year, a regional track each year, and a language track. So in the first year, the skills and method track is approaching history, which is, we are, we are situated in the um, Department of History, Religions and Philosophies, and the Global Liberal Arts degree, uh, its core modules are provided by that department. So approaching history, um, trains you in how to deal with sources. It's not just for historians, but how to do, deal critically with sources. Uh, we have a global track uh, from which I'll um, play you a quick extract from one of the lectures, which is called, well, next year it will be called World Histories, Early Empires and Encounters. And this gives you uh, a global framework for your studies. Then you have the regional introductions from various different areas that are covered by SOAS. And then there's the language track. So you learn a language or, and we encourage you to learn a language, especially in the first year, because uh, a lot of people who are unsure about learning languages, um, maybe you should try out a language in the first year because in the first year, your uh, marks don't count towards uh, the end result of your degree. But anyway, we do encourage you to try to learn a language. Um, or if you feel really uncertain, you don't want to do that, then there are options for learning about language. Uh, year two, so again, we have the skills and method track, the global track, the regional track, and the language and literatures track. 
Um, and in the skills and method track, we have philosophies of interpretation and understanding. That's a, basically a philosophy module, which uh, helps you to learn to think abstractly. In the um, global track, we have African and Asian cultures in the diaspora, for example, economic, economics of global, of, of de developing countries, ethnomusicology, public international law. You can take a whole range of stuff from throughout the university. And then in the regional track, we have, um, for example, art and culture in Imperial China. Again, regional um, choices. And then you can also change, uh, continue with the language and literatures. And then finally, in the um, third year, you have the skills and methods uh, uh, track, which ends up with a dissertation, a 10,000 word essay on a topic of your choice. Uh, again, you continue with the global track, with the regional track, and you can continue with language or literature. Okay, so I'm just going to give you then a short excerpt from a lecture that the students were given this year as part of the H102 World Histories course. Uh, it's the introductory session from the introductory session. And I'm just going to play this back to you. And then after that, we can have a question and answer on anything we've talked about. What about the world? Well, until recently, many people grew up with a map of the world that looks like this, all lots of different colors, very nice, um, designating different imperial distributions of lands, but also possessing a characteristic shape. This is Bacon's standard map of the world, um, which is based on the Mercator project projection, which goes down, back down to the, uh, back to the 16th century, I think. And it's essentially a projection of the world, an attempt to make the world into a, from a sphere into a rectangle. And if you do that, if you imagine that you flatten out um, what's been drawn onto a sphere into a flat rectangle, then obviously things are going to get distorted. And that's precisely what's happened here. You see Greenland and Africa look like they're the same size. Africa and North America as well, they look like they're the same size. India looks smaller than Scandinavia, uh, for example. Nowadays, we have a few alternatives to this typical map of the world. Um, the map on the left by Neil Kay tries to show the respective sizes of countries. It's very much about being divided into countries rather than land masses, um, and does so in a two-dimensional focus, a two-dimensional axis. Um, and you can see there that the problem is you've got all these white bits. So the land masses don't meet up with each other. You can't actually see what's next to what very easily. So that's an accurate map, but it's a rather difficult to use map. The one on the right is a bit of a compromise. This is what's referred to as an equal area map, but it's also been made more aesthetically pleasing or more accessible for us, really. It tries to show the relative sizes of the land masses, but at the same time, it uh, tries to make it accessible as a map that we can relate to, um, even if there are some inaccuracies. So for example, Antarctica at the bottom there does, looks like it covers the whole of the world and is absolutely enormous compared to all other land masses. But what we can see from these two maps is how absolutely enormous the land masses of Africa and Asia are and how much of the world they take up. How India is actually quite considerably bigger than Scandinavia uh, and indeed of Europe. So this gives us a much fairer representation of the distribution of land in the world, of the land masses at least. And one would think if all things were fair that 
Africa and Asia would be the central powerhouses of a world economy because they are at the center and they are the largest. However, that's obviously not the case. And why is it not the case? Well, let's go back to our Mercator map where Greenland was the same size as Africa. And let's look at our red areas there. These are, this map is from 1907. And at this time, this world was dominated by the British Empire. So, colonialism. This is obviously one of the topics that we're going to be talking about in this course. The British weren't the first colonialists, um, but they are among one of the more significant. And certainly, that's what we get taught in this country, is that the British Empire was a extraordinarily important thing. Indeed, it was. Um, however, considering world history from the perspective of the history of colonialism, whether we think colonialism is a good thing or a bad thing, is in fact to exclude once again all of these very large areas which make up most of the world. So colonialism is frequently a distorting lens through which to view history and in this course we're going to try and put colonialism in its place. We're going to try and show how there is an independent world in these places that colonialists came to and enthralled to their power, and that these places interacted with colonialism. They weren't just subjected to it. And they changed colonialism. So one of the things that we want people to be able to get out of this course is that these very large areas of the world that we usually only see through a colonial lens have their own histories. And that history frequently needs to be reconstructed by listening to the voices of the sources that come from these areas. Let's have a look at another way of considering history of the world. This is the Histo map. It was made by one Robert Sparks in 1931, and there used to be a lot of these kind of things. And you can see he's trying to map 4,000 years of world history again. And he does this according to what he calls the relative power of contemporary states, nations, and empires. So for him, the historical subjects, the the entities that make a difference to history are states, nations, and empires. This is something that we would want to question because states, nations, and empires are not always identical with the thousands and millions of people who live in them, who perhaps don't have a share in the imperial wealth. So here's the histo map. Now, this was written at a time, as I say, when there were a lot of people were doing this kind of thing. And you had a lot of attempts to write a kind of global history that encompassed everything. So there was a famous study of history by Arnold Toynbee, for example, in 12 volumes that saw the world very much through this kind of lens as a series of rising and falling of civilizations who held power um, to the detriment and exclusion of other civilizations, or other people, let's put it that way. And it's not surprising that this kind of thinking about history arose in this time. It's very much of its time. The 1930s were the time of eugenics, of racial theory, of so-called racial science, the ideas that you could 
basically breed humans like cats and dogs and um, somehow make them better in some sense. Obviously, no one accepts that anymore, that human beings are divided up into races that are to be bred like cats and dogs. But um, this was a very, very frequent idea at the beginning of the uh, 1930s, during the 1920s, and it was an idea that led, obviously, to disastrous consequences uh, towards the end of the 1930s with the rise to power of the Nazis um, and similar movements, not only in Germany, but across the world. So this was a very normal way of looking at things. And it's always important when you consider any kind of viewpoint that you ask, what kind of society did this arise in? And how can we understand this viewpoint against the backdrop of the society that it comes from and the kind of debates that are going on at the time? So here we have the Mediterranean people, the Alpine people, the Semitic people, the Alpine and Proto-Nordic people, and the Mongolian people. So these are the racial characteristics that this person thinks make up the motor of history. The other thing that one can observe is that this kind of approach to history assumes that it's a kind of zero-sum game that basically there's a limited amount of power to be had and it gets divided up among different peoples at different times. Let's have a look at it in a bit, uh, in a bit more detail. So if we go to the end of the histo map, here we are. United States of America has got quite a lot of power according to um, Mr. Sparks in the early 1930s, probably the most powerful place on earth. You've got England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales coming in second there possibly. It's like a bit of a competition, isn't it? Let's pan back a little bit further. British Empire, France, so the period of imperialism essentially in the 1800s. Uh, following the United States back, we get back to 1600 and there's suddenly nothing there. So there's no United States before 1600. Well, politically speaking, there wasn't a United States until much later than that. But as far as this history is concerned, Americans do not go back past 1600. Now, the British East India Company was founded in 1600. Seven years later, the colonization of... Um, of uh, America began and one thing that immediately springs out of considering this map is that all the people that lived in the Americas for all those centuries thousands of years before the coming of the colonialists they don't exist as far as this map is concerned because they're not historically significant as far as the maker of this map is concerned. Again, this is something that we hope to disabuse ourselves of in the course of this lecture or in the course of this lecture series. As this is SOAS, we are, and as the title of the course suggests, mainly going to be looking at populations and developments in Africa and Asia. However, you can see from this map, it's a very good illustration there, how historical significance is connected to race, and race is connected to nation. And nation is clearly seen to be, or well, the nation state is clearly seen to be the vehicle of history. And without having that nation state, there can be no history. So suddenly America just stops at 1600. So let's go back a little bit further. Pan back. 
Ottoman Turks, Mongolians before them taking up most of the power, the, the, the limited amount of power that's available in the world. And we go back further, Roman Empire, and the Byzantine, or Holy Roman Empire, sorry, and the Byzantine Empire. The Barsids, Muslim Arabs and Persians, Franks. Roman Empire, absolutely enormous. And one has to remember, I think, that uh, the Roman Empire lived beside a very, very large Parthian Empire and other imperial formations um, that were also very large. If you think the Roman Empire was only really around the Mediterranean and up to Britain, that's actually quite a small area. But that's not what you learn about at school. What you learn about is how the Roman Empire was really, really important. And so this map doesn't give you, this, this, this histo map doesn't give you any kind of real uh, historical argument. It simply reflects the perception that is communicated um, in school history. Go back to the Persians and the Greeks. And the earlier we get, you see, the more the focus begins necessarily to shift away from Europe, away from the colonial center. And we see that earlier on, it's your Babylonians, your Assyrians, i.e. people from Asia, exactly the areas that we're going to be talking about, who take up the most space in this. So, That gives us a slight overview of various different types of approaches to world history. And as said, we're going to be looking at history of not only types of people who usually get left out of the record, rather than doing a history of events and great battles and great men and politicians and that kind of thing. And then we're going to be looking also at areas that frequently get out, left out of the historical record because of colonialism, because most of the historians that write about world history were educated in a world that has been fundamentally formed by colonialism. And in fact, the historical discipline the discipline of history itself as an academic discipline started in the colonial world. And many of its basic concepts are colonial concepts. Okay, so that was the extract from the lecture. So I would suggest we move now to um, the Q&A. Have we got anything in the chat? We've got a couple in the chat and also a couple in the actual Q&A. Right, okay. Um, so a couple in the Q&A. So Q&A, we've got um, Sophia Pease asking, I was wondering if there are any SOAS-based scholarships funding options for international students. Uh, yes, we have a scholarships of office. Um, and uh, those are the people I think you need to get in touch with. Uh, it's quite easy to find on the website. Just type in scholarships office. Have you got anything you'd like to add to that, Ang Um No, all I will say is um, there's been quite a few new scholarships and there's been a bit of rejigging around, um, but the website has been updated now. So they should all be on there um, with their uh, closing dates and who's eligible. Um, but again, if, if you need to know anything else or you want more information, there's an email address there. You can find out more. Okay, great. And then there's a further question from Sophia. Um, how does the one grade lower system work if it applies, particularly for international qualifications? My high school diploma is graded on a scale of one to 10, 10 being usual. 
I, I'm afraid I haven't got an answer to that. Have you got something, Anne Uh Yeah, so this year, because of um, COVID and because of um, all the disruptions, what we've said is that if students um, have been accepted onto a course and have to get certain grades, if it turns out they don't get those grades, we will accept them if they are one grade lower. Um, so say, for example, you were you needed to get AAA in A-levels and you got AAB, we would still accept you for the course. Um, it works out, um, we do have equivalents for international qualifications. Um, I'm not quite sure with that particular example what the sort of, I don't know how much one grade in A-level would be in equivalent, um, but we can advise you on that specific qualification if you, again, just give us an email. Uh, the, the general email, if you need to know any of these things, is study at soas.ac.uk. Okay, thank you very much. Then we've got a question from Mark about the uh, lecture, who says, uh, maybe I'm overthinking this, but what exactly makes that map a map quite? At first, it seems more like a graph, since it doesn't represent the geographical locations of these societies. That's that's absolutely right. Um, uh, that's the uh, maker of the map who called it a histo map. Um, and I suppose what he's trying to say is that the world is a rectangle, as it were, and you have um, various different um, entities which occupy it over a certain amount of space. But you remember his his map, as he's calling it, is a map that uh, traces the amount of power that states have. So I don't know, I, I think you're quite right. It's probably better to just call it a graph, isn't it? Rather than a map. Um, quite right, that's a very perceptive question. Thank you very much. Have we got any other questions? So something in the chat. Um, so um so sophia asks again um do you know if chinese is currently not offered in the website it says to contact the department directly i'm not sure how to go about that well uh chinese is definitely offered absolutely chinese is being taught this year and will be taught next year there's absolutely no uh way that chinese is uh not going to be taught at soas uh, so, yes, we have people on the Global Liberal Arts degree doing Chinese at the moment, um, and it's definitely uh, uh, something to be encouraged. So uh, on the website, it says to, the, to um, contact the department directly, but um, you can do that by, um, on the website, there should be a, um, a page which says uh, uh, where the main addresses are um so you can you should be able to con contact the department through the website or you can contact the department through the admissions department what would you say to that and Harold? Oh, sorry okay. i couldn't find my unmute button um <laughs> yeah so um again to contact admissions just use the study at soas email address yeah and comment on the lecture there. So it's like the single story mindset. Absolutely. Uh, this is something that we're trying to counteract, um, that there isn't just one story or one way of approaching any particular issue, whether it be history, philosophy, uh, politics. There are lots of different um, approaches and multiple factors that need to be taken into account. And it's precisely this kind of approach of uh, which emphasizes the multiplicity of factors and causes and different disciplinary approaches that the global liberal arts degree is trying to train people to appreciate. Um, so Malika asks, what's the number of students usually present for the lectures of this course? So you're referring to the um, particular lecture that I was giving, uh, that I, I, I uh, just played a fragment from, so that particular course has 41 people on it, registered on it. And um, yeah, around between 30 and 40 is the 
number of students you'd usually have present for that particular course. Um, the global histories, the world histories course. Um, are there any field trips involved? Well, yes and no. Um, we are trying to organize a year abroad for global liberal arts. So as we've got a language and literature track and we do like people to do languages, um, one thing we want to get going, which has been difficult to get going so far, but uh, hopefully we'll manage it in the next year or so, is for global liberal arts students to have a third year, an extra year that they can take abroad if they want. So it'd be like between years three and four and they'd go to the country of the language that they're studying uh so yes so that's um that's some, certainly something that we're, we're trying to plan field trips it depends on the module but um quite a few teachers involve field trips whether that's going somewhere in london to look at something or um or something even more ambitious uh, so yes, individual modules can have field trips. It's, 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 it's certainly something that we encourage teachers at SOAS to do. Um, okay. Uh, something, anything you can't, oh, right, okay. Um, so similar question, is Arabic a language that's offered? Absolutely, again, there will never be a year at SOAS where Arabic is not offered. So Arabic is extremely popular and um, and continues to be taught. And again, extremely important for global liberal arts. A lot of people take Arabic. All right then. Um, yeah, is it likely, all the big question coming in here, is it likely that university life will be back to normal in September? What is the current plan? Oh, well, I hope so. I think we all hope so. Um, the current plan is that yes, it will. Uh, but unfortunately, the current plan was that it was going to be getting back to normal by now, but uh, the previous plan, sorry, and uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, so, yes, we will obviously be uh, depending on um, advice from the government, but we hope indeed that we will be back to normal uh, by September, or at least back to a format that involves majority face-to-face -face encounters between staff and students, I would say. The current situation that we have with the online provision of courses has been very difficult for all of us, but also has offered us an opportunity to learn a great deal about how we teach. And I'm sure there's going to be aspects of this that we will keep on. So for example, using pre-recorded lectures and interactive online fora for debate um, in the run-up to uh, live sessions and stuff, face-to-face -face sessions. These are things that I think we've learned how to use a lot better. And it's so once we get back to something approaching normal, it's going to be a much better experience that everyone's going to have all round. Uh, What, so it sort of sounds like SOAS doesn't take a particularly realist perspective on much topics, Sophia says, uh, since it looks way beyond just nation states and their power, would you say it's more like social constructivism? Oh, um, well, certainly social constructivist, uh, yeah, you, you mean realist in the, tem in the terms of, uh, in the terms of uh, uh, sort of philosophy of history. Um, Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that's social constructivism, the idea that uh, history is something that is constructed by the historian um, is essentially is, is definitely um, an approach that, that we take. Uh, and indeed, um, I would say that I personally, as a historian, find that the uh, nation state is a very restricting way to look at uh, the development of history. So um, I'm obviously just one historian at SOAS though, there's lots of other ones um, who take different perspectives. So I don't think we can say that SOAS has a brand, as it were, approach to history or to politics, um, but you are going to find a multiplicity of approaches. 
and a great diversity of approach is possibly greater than you will find at other places, I would imagine. Okay, are the so we've also got here how uh, Malika says, uh, how is the course taught? Are there regular lectures or self research based? Both, basically. Um, in your first year, second year, it's going to be more regular lecture based. So you'll have four lectures. You have to do four uh, modules a, uh, a year, and you'll get a main lecture in one of those, in each of those, sorry, a main lecture of say an hour, and then a tutorial, which will either be small groups or a seminar with a larger group um, in each of those as well. So you should be expecting to get say two hours, two or three hours per module, and you'll have four modules um, a term. And uh, that's, yes, so that's the basic, the basic uh, structure. So we try to get a combination of lecturing and discussion going on because the discussion is where the real learning happens, essentially. And as you go through the degree, you take courses which are more oriented towards your own research. So once you get to um, the third year, then you are going to be working for one of your modules on your own dissertation, your 10,000 word essay, which is on a topic of your choosing, essentially, and which is largely based on your own research, but is that is research which is guided and advised by a individual supervisor. Okay. Uh, do we have any more, Ang Harry, that you can see questions? Oh, I haven't, I've been ignoring the Q&A. Yeah, we've also got a few in the Q&A. All right, so um, Peter asks, can we take both Mandarin and Cantonese simultaneously? I'm sorry, I don't know about that. Um, I think I would imagine, yes. Uh, I would imagine one would be able to develop from one into the other, um, but that's something you'll need to find out from the uh, department, from the East Asia department. Um, should we be taught from a younger age about the negative effects of colonialism? I think absolutely we should, uh, but what, I was trying to get at in that short extract from the lecture is that um, whether one thinks of it negatively or positively, colonialism is something that's shaped the way that we think about things. And it's a matter of unpacking this kind of um, bias that's inbuilt into the way we think about things and asking where the way we think about things comes from, how the knowledge that we assume to have about the world has been constructed and frequently uh, the kind of categories that we think in, whether we're doing history, politics or whatever, are ones that have been largely formed by uh, colonialism. Are assessments mostly exam based? Well, no, this is something we're moving away from. There is a certain amount of exam based assessment, particularly for languages. I don't think you're ever going to get away from that. Um, where, uh, but um, although it is possible if uh, if people have certain circumstances, then it is possible to, for, to apply for alternative assessments. Um, yes, but we are moving away from a system that is mostly exam based to one that is uh, more coursework based, so more based on essays, for example, or other kinds of tests. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be essays. I mean, there's, there's, there's all sorts of different types of courseworks that we're introducing. Learning journals, for example, is a very interesting uh, method of assessment that uh, a lot of people are trying out at the moment and seems to be very effective where you have to write a few words each week about an article you've read each week. Um, and then you get an assessment on the whole journal that you've written over the year um, or at least over the semester at the end of that semester. Uh, so that's Q and A. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, and so uh, we've got another question. When exactly will it be possible to add a year abroad to your three year programs already now and sometime in the future? Um, sometime in the future, I'd say year after next probably. So if you were to start Global Liberal Arts next year, you would probably be able to do a year abroad. 
I think we need to hear from Medina about the experience at, uh, of studying at SOAS. Yes, um, I just feel that, especially with the pandemic, it just feels very short because I'm in my third year now. And um, so by the time I finish my degree, half of it has been in lockdown, but the time I've been in, on campus has been great. I've really loved it because the atmosphere at SOAS is so friendly and unlike any other university because you're surrounded by people who are not only curious about their studies but also about the world and especially with the uh, global liberal arts people that are most likely interested in this are also um, have quite a, a world view so it's good it's good to be surrounded by people like that so you have great conversations but apart from this studying at SOAS and in London has been amazing as well so there are many societies and clubs you can participate in the support system is great whether it's your uh, lecturers your academic advisors or the well-being team so especially in the current climate I think so has, has really gone beyond to ensure the students are coping well and staying on top of their studies mm -hmm. thanks Medina you've got a question in the chat there oh uh, let's have a look. I think my chat has disappeared. I'll just try, <laughs> I'll just try to get it up again. I, I just stopped screen sharing, didn't I? So that probably messed everything up for everyone. Oh. Um, it says, hi, Medina, what is the student union like? It's from Sophia, uh, as well as the club societies. Uh, the student union, especially at SOAS, is such a vibrant and such a exciting place. There's so many interesting societies and uh, to choose from. So I know there's one which is a pizza society where they got together and had pizza. So that was nice and quirky. Um, yeah, there's so there's a lot of um, sports clubs as well. So um, so as is part of the University of London, so you can um, sign up to Student Central, which is just down the road, and you can take part in uh, the clubs and societies offered by them. So yeah, there's a lot to do. We've also just uh, created a virtual tour of SOAS campus. Um, we got some, uh, we got a company with drones and so they've come over SOAS and you can get a 360 sort of bird's eye view of the campus and you can then click through to different parts such as the library or the students union. And, you know, in these current times where you can't actually get to the campus and see what it's like, it's a really good, sort of alternative. So I'll just post the link to that in the chat in case anyone wants to have a look at it. But thank you. Thank you very much, Medina. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Oh, another question for you, Medina. Does SOAS have anything related to dance? Uh, very likely. I mean, the best place to find out more information would be the Student Union uh, page. Uh, there you'll be able to see a list of all the clubs and societies, but I'm pretty sure there is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there been, is. Yeah. It would be very unusual if it didn't. Uh, dance and there's lots, there's an incredible music department at SOAS as well. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Okay, have we reached the end of this? I think there's, there's one final... Okay. Um, oh, hang on. There's, there's two more questions, which we probably have time for, and then we'll probably have to wrap it up. Um, is there a language option of Russian? Oh, no. No, I don't think there is at SOAS. Um, but uh, you can learn it at UCL. And yes, indeed, there is a University of London resource sharing scheme. Um, well, OK, you can... Every every SOAS student is entitled to take at least one course at UCL every year. Um, and not many people do, though, but that is there. That is there. Yes. And there's one more on the chat about uh, employment after a global liberal arts degree. Yeah. Uh, yeah oh what employment avenues with a okay and 
Yes, indeed. OK, so we haven't the Global Liberal Arts degree at SOAS has not been going for that long, but um, it's a, a kind of degree that's much better known in the US. Um, and Global Liberal Arts degrees from other universities are also very successful in producing people who are extremely employable. So um, what we're aiming to train people to be able to do is to enter um, a multiple multiple professions um, such as well journalism is what people want to go for we have people who are um, doing global liberal arts at the moment who are aiming uh, to work for NGOs for example um, because global liberal arts can allow you to combine law uh, with um, more humanities subjects in ways that uh, you know other degrees can't law is usually something that just gets studied by lawyers um on law degrees that's that's again another avenue that people can go into and it's all also always possible if you decide you want to specialize in something particular it's always possible to do an ma afterwards and i would mostly nowadays say that whatever degree you do in the humanities whether it's history um, um or indeed in the social sciences whatever degree you do that you should normally take an MA afterwards as well just to uh, to specialize a little bit because the degree shows that you can do certain things it shows that you're able to you have certain transferable skills but um, nowadays more and more people are doing an MA as well and with the global liberal arts degree that makes a lot of sense too but yes um multiple professions and this is precisely what the global liberal arts degree is supposed to be training people to do is to make a fruitful contribution to any number of employment settings thank you very much mark and thank you medina and thank you to all our participants if there's a question that you didn't get to ask um i'm sure if you email the department uh, is that right, Mark? We can probably get an answer to that. Or if it's more general about studying at SOAS, then email us at study at SOAS. I'll tell you um, what, I can yep. put I can put my uh, my email. Oh, that would be chat. great. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. If anyone wants to ask about global liberal arts particularly, then there's my email. Thanks. That's really useful. And okay. I hope everyone has a lovely rest of the weekend. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Bye.